Many Muslims mistakenly think that Islamic financing is a good thing, that the ban on interest is really an ethical argument at heart. There are even modern finance organizations that claim that Islamic financing is more ethical somehow, and that this industry is growing. Some translations of the Quran translate riba as usury, which means excessive interest. They are making it look like the problem is ripping off people. This is completely wrong, and I'm going to show you how strange and weird Islamic finance is and how it harmed me in my life. This is your friendly neighborhood ex-Muslim, Abdullah Samir. Let's get to it. The Quran says, Those who consume riba cannot stand, except as one who is being beaten by Satan into insanity. That is because they say, trade is just like riba. But Allah has permitted trade and has forbidden riba. And then whoever returns to dealing in riba, those are the companions of the fire. They will abide eternally therein. Very serious indeed. War with Allah? Companions of the fire? Other hadith emphasize just how bad this is. It's worse than adultery even. We know the, the terrible sin of riba. This is, of all the sins of Islam, really after shirk, there's probably no sin that I think the Muslims uh, have uh, utter awe of in terms of the possibilities of eternal damnation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the only time that a declaration of war from Allah and His Prophet is mentioned in the Quran is in relation to the sin of usury. But what is riba exactly? Is it simply excessive interest? Yasir Qadi will explain. Riba. What is riba? We translate it as interest. But in Islamic finance, riba is a little bit more broad than interest, a little bit more technical than interest. Uh, and it is true that what we call interest is the primary manifestation of riba. And Riba is something that was common and predominant in many societies, including in Islam, pre-Islamic Arabia. It was well known and it was common. If I gave you a uh, thousand dinars, a thousand dollars, whatever, I would demand a thousand one hundred, you know, after two months. And if you were late, a thousand two hundred. If you were later than that, a thousand three hundred. This is the standard form of riba. Now, technically speaking, there are other types of riba in Islam, but this is the most common one that we're still aware of and it is still commonly practiced to this day. When Islam came, our Prophet Sallallahu explicitly forbade riba. And the Quran equated riba with declaring war against God and His Messenger. There is no other sin in Islam. There is no other sin in Islam that has been equated with declaring war. It's as if you're waging war against your own Creator. There is no sin that has that strict language attached to it. And there are many evils in Islam that you're not supposed to do. You're not supposed to murder, you're not supposed to steal, you're not supposed... There are many sins and each one has some punishment, there's no question about it. But this specific punishment of declaring war against God and His Messenger, no other sin has been given that description. Our Prophet Sallallahu forbade interest and he called it of the major sins. And in one hadith he said, avoid the seven deadly sins, the seven sins that are destructive. And of those seven deadly sins, in that list is murder. In that list is worshiping a false god, an idol. And in that list is riba. Can you believe murder and riba are in the same list? That is enough of a, 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 a warning for us that in the same list that is mentioned murder, the Prophet mentions riba. So interest, any interest at all, is one of the forms of riba. To Sunni Muslims, the first place you look to get an understanding of what is riba in the Quran is in the Hadith, the sayings of Muhammad. The definition of riba is actually very strange. As Yasir Qadi said, it's a misconception that it only means interest. Let me show you something. The Hadith says, The Messenger of Allah said, Gold for gold, weight for weight, like for like, and silver for silver. Weight for weight, like for like. Whoever gives more or takes more has engaged in riba. Narrated in Nasai. Once Bilal brought Bani, a type of dates, to the Prophet, and the Prophet asked him, From where have you brought these? 
Bilal said, I had some inferior types of dates and I exchanged two sa'as, a measurement, for one sa'a of bani dates in order to give it to the Prophet. Thereupon the Prophet said, Beware, beware, this is definitely riba, this is definitely riba, don't do so. But if you want to buy better dates, sell the inferior dates for money and then buy the superior kind of dates with that money, Bukhari. Why wouldn't it be okay to trade crappy dates for good dates? But it would be okay to sell them for cash first and then buy them? Really strange, nonsensical even. I remember in an Islamic finance seminar, oddities like these were explained away with, well, what's the difference between marriage and adultery? Nothing really, except the contract, right? What the Sheikh was trying to say was with Islamic finance, the only difference is one is approved by Allah and the other is not. But other than that, there's no material difference. Sheikh Tawfiq Trodri, the founder of al Kautha Institute and the teacher of an Islamic finance seminar, even emphasizes with a story that I will share with you. He said, in Saudi, he wanted to trade his mom's gold for better gold. Maybe 14 karat for 24 karat or whatever. So he walked into the store, sold his inferior gold, and then walked out of the store, walked right back in the store, and then bought the new gold. Apparently this isn't required, but he wanted to be extra sure that his new transaction was halal and not riba or linked to the previous one because you can't combine two transactions in one. All these Islamic conditions come back to what Muhammad supposedly said and did. I can give you another example of how nonsensical Islamic finance is. And even as a Muslim, I was challenging Sheikh Tawfiq about this because it didn't add up to me. According to Islamic finance, paying interest is haram. Any sort of additional payment on top of the cost. So if I wanted to buy a car at 4.99% interest financed over five years, that's not allowed. However, some of the car dealers did something sneaky here. They calculated the interest price and added it to the car up front, offering 0% financing on it. But if you paid cash, there was a $2,000 discount. So really, the interest was $2,000. But this is halal. When I asked the sheikh, what's the difference between this case and paying $2,000 of interest? He said, brother, just go relax, have a coffee and you will understand. Meaning, I can't explain this to you, but it's just the way it is. One of the more useful contracts in the modern world is the insurance contract. The insurance contract allows you to pay a small monthly fee, which is pooled together in case somebody in the group has an accident and needs a large amount of money. For example, when my kitten got sick, the wet fees were in the thousands of dollars. I ended up having to give away the kitten. To the Humane Society, who had wet would be able to work on such cases for free. After this happened, I decided to get insurance for my cats. I pay $30 a month and I am covered for up to $2,000 of medical bills in case of injury or illness. To me, it makes sense because I wouldn't have $2,000 lying around for an emergency. How can this not be a good thing? This ancient practice of pooling money together in case of disaster is now so instrumental today in modern finance. If you ask Muslim scholars, they will say insurance is gambling. If you get life insurance, they say you're gambling your life for money. It's very stupid. The reason I got a 20-year term life insurance, after leaving Islam of course, is because I am the sole breadwinner and in case I die, my family's financial needs will be covered. Once the 20 years are up, my kids will be earning themselves and it won't be a big deal if I die. But right now, it would be a disaster for the family. If you ask me, not getting life insurance or fire insurance for your home or auto insurance for your car is what is gambling. Gambling with your family's well-being, your well-being, your home, all of it. I remember a Somali family that the house burned down and they were begging for money outside the mosque. The reason? They had no insurance on the home because it was haram. To me, insurance is the opposite of gambling. It's making sure that things are in the proper place in case disaster strikes. Here's another sad story. I had a Muslim doctor friend who made good money but could never buy a home for his family because of all these rules. Eventually, this grown man, him and his wife and his five kids, now six, ended up buying a home with his parents because that's the only way they could buy a home halal. And they used this expensive halal mortgage to do it. On the personal side, this is what I experienced as well. Having to rent a home was not easy. 
I had landlords over the years who would give us notice to leave because they wanted to sell or because their sister was moving in or because they're going back to India or whatever. I've had landlords come into my home and tell me, tell your kids to put the toys in a box. Imagine that. Telling someone who's paying you $1,500 a month to rent the home where to put the toys. It was insulting to say the least. So you didn't have the stability. You couldn't upgrade or customize your home in any way. You were dependent on the landlord for fixing the fridge or whatever needed to be done. And often they wouldn't want to do it because it costed them money. And when you died, you had nothing to leave for your family. When we were asked to move, I would call up places looking for a place to rent and say I'm looking for a place. And when they asked me how many kids, and I told them three, at the time I had three, they would suddenly say the house wasn't available. This is the experience many practicing Muslims go through. They struggle dealing with the pains of home rental, even if they can afford to buy, because riba is haram. Another friend of mine saved cash for 10 to 15 years in order to buy a home. He was lucky that he made enough money to do so, but he wasn't able to buy in Toronto, the place that him and his family lived their entire lives. They ended up buying a home over 100 kilometers away in a small town where houses were cheaper. This friend was making a six-figure salary, but even he couldn't buy a home. If he would have, it would have been where he wanted to live. It would have been worth millions today in the downtown core of Toronto. But for Allah's sake, he made that sacrifice and only recently bought a home far away. Now he has to commute hours daily to his office. All of these sacrifices, for what, I ask? Because of a God that gets angry at you for involving in riba? For a heaven that's never coming or to avoid a hell that burns you because you're at war with Allah? This is spiritual compulsion, a religion that affects and shapes your decisions in a way that harms your well-being. This is why I speak about Islam. Thanks for watching. Consider joining the channel below by clicking join now. The more members I have, the less chance I will be removed from YouTube in the future. These topics sometimes get flagged, as you know, and certain ideas are dangerous to the Islamic establishment, so they actively try to remove them. Your vote of support can be shown for as little as $2 a month. Please consider it. Thanks. Your friendly neighborhood ex-Muslim Abdullah Samir signing out.